Good evening, respected doctors and clinicians. Welcome to Liver Talk. Liver Talk signifies as enumerated expert clinical views on liver disease. The purpose behind this Liver Talk is to create a platform which can be used as a meaningful knowledge interface between the gastroenterologist and consulting physicians. And in this program, renowned gastroenterologist will impart the expert clinical views in the treatment of liver disease to help in the early stage diagnosis and also in the proper management of it. Today's topic for discussion for liver talk will be non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, a silent epidemic. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome and introduce a eminent speaker gastroenterologist, Dr. Parimal S. Lawate, to speak on this very matter. Dr. Parimal S. Lawate is an MD medicine and DM gastroenterologist from CMC Velo. He is an active member of FSGEI, that is Fellow Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy of India. He has been awarded with the prestigious AGF, that is Fellow of American Gastroenterology Association, about four years back. He is the director, director of Department of Gastroenterology and Liver Disease, based at Pune. The hospital name is Jahangir Hospital. He is also attached as a consultant gastroenterologist at Dinanath Mangeshkar Super Specialty Hospital at Pune. He is the recipient of Times of India Health Icons Award in the first year itself in its inception in Pune. He was the Wagatzin chairman for the National Annual Conference of Indian Society of Gastroenterology, that is ISGCON, 2020 and 2021. And he is practicing gastroenterologist for about 31 years. He has about 20 publications, including three textbook chapters to his study. Besides his academic expertise, he is also having different hobbies altogether because he believes life exists beyond gastroenterology. He is an avid photographer. Some of his photos have been featured in the reputed travel magazines. He plays the keyboard professionally. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Parimales Lavate. He will be enlightening us today in the topic of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the silent epidemic. Over to you, sir. Sure. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, I'm indeed grateful to Saffron for giving me this opportunity. We had a very big epidemic, which by no means was silent, which was the corona epidemic. And we hope that it will die down and we would not have another wave. But this is an epidemic, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease which of course is silent. So there are so many people who are suffering from it, but they do not have symptoms. And it is indeed in epidemic proportions. And uh, it, it is indeed a silent epidemic where over the years, people have a lot of problems related to liver disease. And then it can uh, harm these people in various ways. So the topic given to me today is uh, NAFLD, the silent epidemic. Uh, we can have the slides uh, uh, sharing to be started. <coughs> so today, actually, what we will do is uh, it's a bit of a didactic lecture. And we'll basically stress on the approach to these patients who have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And uh, we'll touch upon the therapeutics and so on. This predominantly deals with adult uh, patients because I do not deal with pediatric gastroenterology. And uh, we will keep it more clinic oriented. So for people who are practicing in their clinics, hopefully this talk should be very useful and it should uh, help in management of these patients. Next slide. So what we will do today is uh, we have a brief introduction. We'll see what are the presentations and approach to a patient with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We'll be referring to this as NAFLD from now on. Uh, how to evaluate these patients in the clinic, how to apply this evaluation to your individual patients <clears throat> at the clinic level. 
before going to the basis of treatment, uh, natural history needs to be discussed. Uh, needless to say, we will not really discuss much on the pathophysiology of this condition. And then we'll uh, discuss about non-pharmacologic and pharma pharmacologic treatments for this. And finally, a concluding side on how you should uh, apply all this when you have a patient in front of you. Next slide. So the first question which comes to your mind is, is it really an epidemic? So yes, indeed, it is an epidemic. And there's a lot of data which shows that it is an epidemic. Next slide. So there is Indian data and there is data from the world, which shows that the number of people affected by this condition are in fact far more than number of people who are affected by the corona epidemic. So if you look at these distributions here, you find that there are some countries where almost 30% of the population has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. If you focus on some of these studies here, <clears throat> like the one by Dr. Singh and Dr. Amrapurkar, you find that almost one in four adults, say about 35 years age and above, will have fatty liver on screening on ultrasound. So there's a very huge proportion of people who have this condition. Next slide. There have been various ways in which people have studied this. So people have looked at ultrasound to look for fatty liver. People have looked at uh, insulin resistance parameters like you can see in the third column. And some people have looked at liver biopsy in uh, these patients. Now, knowing that this is an epidemic, we need, definitely need to deal with it and see how you can prevent it and treat it. So how do you define non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? So the first, of course, is absence of significant alcohol intake. The second is you should have some fatty liver on imaging and the fat should be more than 5% of the liver weight. Now, there is no standard means of taking out the liver and measuring how much fat is there, obviously. But there are ways and means which have been uh, devised on which you can say that probably, yes, there's more than 5% fat in this patient's liver. And then you look at features of metabolic syndrome and associated uh, multi-system involvement. So basically, the definition of NAFLD uh, is exclusion of other factors for fatty liver and confirming that there is a fatty liver in that particular patient. There is some change in terminology which has been proposed of late. And uh, there is a suggestion that this should be called as metabolic associated fatty liver disease. But I think for today's discussion, rather than going into controversies or nomenclature, we'll stick to the old terminology. Next slide. So this is actually important because when we say that no significant alcohol intake, we should be able to calculate what a patient is taking actually. So roughly, it is good to remember how much alcohol 10 grams of alcohol is in what amount of drink. So about 30 to 40 ml of whiskey or hard drink, so-called. About 120 ml of wine and 360 ml of beer. These will contain 10 grams of alcohol. Once your intake starts exceeding about 20 grams on a regular basis, your risk of having liver disease increases. And there are various factors which we won't go into which can enhance your risk of developing alcoholic liver disease. So when you face a patient with non-alcoholic liver disease and he is taking alcohol, maybe socially or occasionally or once or twice a week, you should be able to calculate how much alcohol the patient is actually taking. And to that end, this slide is quite important. Next slide. Why is NFLD important? Why are we talking about it? <clears throat> First thing, like I said, is common increasing prevalence. It is not an isolated condition. So we don't look up, look at a patient with NAFLD as an isolated NAFLD patient, but it's a multi-system disease and it's a part of it. In fact, it is a part of the liver manifestation of the metabolic syndrome. It can lead to dangerous consequences like cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. It can drive renal disease in people with diabetes. It can enhance the cardiovascular mortality. In fact, if you look at the three major causes of death in people with NAFLD who have just been diagnosed, the most important is cardiovascular mortality. The next can be malignancies. And the third is liver disease. Because liver disease takes a long time to develop. 
Uh, if you look at the causes for transplant, for that matter, even in India, at most centers, there are two common causes for liver transplant now, which have exceeded the viral hepatitis causes. That is alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In fact, in the very small treatment program of liver transplant, which we have just started at Yagi Hospital, all our patients uh, were of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So it is definitely a common cause for liver transplant, a common cause for chronic liver disease. Next slide. So this just highlights that it is not just the liver you look at when you have a patient with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but you look at all these various aspects and you need to have a broader view or a holistic view in these patients and have appropriate reference. Next slide. Needless to say that all categories of people see these patients. So a gynecologist may see a PCOD patient, an endocrinologist may see a diabetic who has fatty liver and so on and so forth. So it is a multi-system involvement disease and multi-specialists need to be involved in treatment of this disease. Next slide. So what should be the approach to these patients? who have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We will discuss the presentation in a moment. First is you need to establish the diagnosis for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, so that we already discussed, we should rule out the associated causes on history, get a good history of alcohol intake and provided it is reliable, of course. And uh, then you see that there's more fat in the liver. Then you do a clinical and laboratory assessment of these patients. There are very, very few patients nowadays who require a liver biopsy. Then you identify which patients need treatment. So it is not that every patient who comes to you from your wellness center who has a fatty liver needs treatment by way of medicines. Then you decide a treatment plan and decide on follow-up. Uh, like I have put in the box, I think evaluation of the extra hepatic components is extremely important. Next slide. <coughs> So this is just to put some causes of fatty liver other than non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which you should remember in practice. Next slide. So what are the ways in which these patients come to you? So I think by and large, a lot of patients come diagnosed with a fatty liver on some incidental finding. It may be an ultrasound which shows a fatty liver. It may be a LFT report which shows increased ALT and AST or SGPT and SGOT. In fact, if you have a patient coming to you with increased SGPT and SGOT alone, uh, NAFLD is the commonest cause for this condition. Other is you are looking for a cause in a patient with liver disease and then you find it. So these are the two common presentations. Next slide. What are the symptoms? So by and large, a lot of these patients are asymptomatic. So fatty liver on ultrasound, asymptomatic elevation of transaminases, which we just discussed. There can be some symptoms, especially fatigue in some patients, uh, some pain in the right hypochondrium and fullness, that's also pretty common. And of course, if the patient has decompensated at or developed florid liver disease, you find chronic liver disease parameters in these patients. Next slide. What do you do when you are examining these patients clinically? So there are two aspects to it. And the left aspect actually is often overlooked in busy clinic practice. So it is a good idea to have a BMI calculation. The second thing you need to do is also get an idea as to what is the type of the patient's obesity. So if the patient has an apple type of obesity, where the fat is predominantly above the waist. And if you have a pear-shaped obesity, where the fat is predominantly below the waist, around the hips and, hips and so on. So those who have an apple kind of obesity, they basically have a large stomach, small arms, and a lot of visceral obesity. So this is something which you can, uh, once the patient walks into the clinic, you know. And then there is a set of patients which we'll very briefly touch upon, where the BMI and the weight is normal but still they have non-alcoholic factors. So this is called as NASH in or NAFLD in lean individuals or lean NASH. The other thing, like I said, is not only focus on physical examination on the liver and GI tract, but also look at the cardiovascular system, take the patient's blood pressure, 
and not miss out on that and look at the patient's past history comorbidities. So these are things which we commonly do in uh, clinical practice. And uh, mind you, of course, we do this really in all patients. And uh, if you are not going to measure the waist size, you can at least ask the patient what trousers in male patients, what trousers is going to use. Next slide. What are the evaluation modalities? So you can do a laboratory evaluation, you can do an imaging evaluation, or you can do a histopathology evaluation. Of course, histopathology is done very infrequently these days for very select patients. In laboratory, you do a liver function test assessment. You do an assessment for metabolic syndrome. So you look at the uric acid, you look at the HbA1c. If you are interested keenly, you can do the coma IR. And of course, the lipid profile you have to look at. And then you do tests in the laboratory like hepatitis B, hepatitis C, autoimmune liver disease tests for ruling out competing cases. Uh, the basic minimum probably you need to do is at least hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Look for drugs which the patient may be taking which can cause uh, increased transaminases. About imaging, we'll touch upon a little more in detail. And a little bit about histopathology before going to the day-to-day uh, -day management and treatment. Next slide. So liver function tests, various things you can find. Asymptomatic transaminitis, asymptomatic increase in alkaline phosphate is also and gamma GT pretty common. And of course, you can have florid features of cirrhosis. One pointer is low platelets. So if you have low platelets, Always think of chronic liver disease. It is, in fact, a more common cause for low platelets along with vitamin B12 deficiency, more than even ITP in most circumstances. And then, of course, you do, like I said, the other biochemistry to look for comorbidities. Next slide. <clears throat> this is something which uh, we do, I do personally in all patients with non alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is a very easy test to do. So you can have these four parameters. You have the MD Calc app on your mobile phone, or you just put flip four calculator in your mobile, and this will open up. You put the age in years, AST level, ALT level, and platelet count is measured as ten raised to nine. So if the platelet count is three lakh forty eight thousand, you put it as three hundred forty eight. This is very important because. Uh, then you get a correct value. So you don't need to put 3,48,000 there. And we'll discuss as to how you apply it. Now, this square root and all is done automatically by the calculator in your mobile or whatever app you're using. So this you should do in all patients because all of you know each patient's age, you have their platelet count in the hemogram and you have the AST and ALT levels. Mind you, if you have an AST more than ALT in a patient with fatty liver disease, there are two possibilities. The first is, of course, that the patient is an alcoholic and he has alcoholic fatty liver disease. But the important thing is if he definitely is not taking alcohol, if you have the AST more than ALT, think of a silent cirrhosis in that particular patient. And the platelet count, like we just discussed, is very important to look at. The platelet count, in fact, has become very important in gastroenterology. Low platelet, think of liver disease. High platelets think of inflammatory bowel disease. So these that is why the platelet count becomes very important in gastroenterology for all patients who present with various GI symptoms. Next slide. So that was a little on biochemistry, a little bit about ultrasound. Now, this is something which we need to be well versed with. So if you have a liver which is bright, hyperechoic near the transducer and less echoic away from the transducer. It suggests fatty liver, brighter than the kidney generally. So you can always compare it. And next slide. This was what I was uh, trying to say that, uh, how do you know that the patient has more than 5%? So if you have a patient who has a normal liver echogenicity, see the left picture on the left side, labeled as A, the steatosis is less than 5%. If you go to the second picture, uh, you find that the portal vein, uh, vein echogenicity, there is more echogenicity in these. So it's a grade one fatty liver disease. 
So grade two, what here still you can see some dark shadows in between, which are the portal vein radicals. If you go to C, which is uh, grade two fatty liver, you have an obscuring of the echogenic portal vein branches uh, because it is more bright and it is almost similar to the portal vein walls. So here it is almost one third to two thirds fatty liver. And then if you have a diaphragmatic outline, which is obscured, then it is more than two thirds of fatty liver. So this is something which you can very easily remember. And many times the ultrasonologists may not mention this, but there are some who do mention it. And then when you see this report, so when it is grade three, it is more than two thirds. It is grade two, one third to two thirds and so on and so forth. So it is very easy to remember this. And this is uh, something which we need to know essentially in all patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So here the point I've tried to make is the ultrasonologist should not just focus on the fat in the liver, but also look at what is the portal vein diameter. If it is more than say 12 or 13, it indicates portal hypertension. If he looks at collaterals, we know that the patient has already developed cirrhosis. And of course, needless to say, if there's ascites or a tumor in the liver, or if the, uh, the border is irregular, you know that here. So ultrasound should focus on presence or absence, the grading of fatty liver, and thirdly, look at any associated features suggestive of chronic liver disease. So that's about ultrasound in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Next slide. The important test which has come into vogue is a fibro scan. And this has kind of put things into perspective. Now, if we'll discuss a little bit on pathology later. So if you look at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, basically what happens is initially it starts as a fatty liver alone, bland fatty liver, no inflammation, no fibrosis. Then you have inflammation, then you have fibrosis, and then you have cirrhosis. So more the fibrosis, worse it is for the patient. So how do you quantify this fibrosis? Now, like I said, on the ultrasound, we showed how you can quantify the fat, but you can't uh, quantify the fibrosis. So this is a machine which is pretty pricey. And jokingly, I remember one hepatologist saying, that the screen on this fibro scan machine is an ATM counter because the cost involved is a pretty capital intensive machine. And, uh, but it is pretty simple to do and you can have it done in your clinic uh, to know how much is the fibrosis. Now fibrosis is very important for two or three reasons. One is if you have fibrosis, that means there's already damage which has set in. And the second thing is when you're treating a patient, now it has become very clear that if you can reduce the fibrosis, you can change the natural history of that patient's disease. So that is why it is very important. And third thing is if you look at the clinical trials on uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, one degree of lessening of fibrosis is now considered as an endpoint. So for various reasons, it is important to know whether your patient has fibrosis or does not. Next slide. So this is how the picture actually looks. And this is how the measurement is given in kilopascals. It's a quick test about, there are a lot of parameters you have to take care of. Preferably a fasting patient should not have very high ALT, ASD and so on and so forth. We won't go into the details, but this is how you get a picture. Now one value is really not very meaningful. You have to have a follow up and then you know what is happening to the fibrosis in that particular patient. Next slide. So we won't go into this, but in the, the bottom line take home for this slide is that if you have a fibrosis, which is very high, the sensitivity is very high. If you have a fibrosis, which is very low, then again, the sensitivity is very good, but it is for this middle range where the sensitivity can be a little uh, gray area. kind of. Uh, next slide. Then we we'll just touch upon uh, liver biopsy because it is not a topic for today's lecture exactly. But if you look at the left hand uh, picture of a liver biopsy, so these white globules are needless to say the fat in the liver. And you can have it increasing from the left to the right. 
as a spectrum. So if you look at this grade three sixty seven percent, that's a patient. If you do an ultrasound, you will find the diaphragm is abnormally treated, the liver is bright, and the portal vein hyperechogenicity of the walls is lost. So that's how you can correlate roughly. Next slide. Two important features in these patients is the arrow in the middle picture, which shows uh, you can have a ballooned hepatocyte with slightly uh, scalloped margins. And uh, next slide, you can have these blue things, which are called as fibrosis. So these are very thin, initially thin uh, shreds of fibrosis, and they can keep on increasing on the right side. So this is what you what you can detect on your biopsy correlates reasonably well with a fibro scan. That is why you can obviate doing the liver biopsy in a lot of these patients. Next slide. Now, how do you apply these tests in clinical practice? Next slide. <clears throat> so this is pretty important. Now, if you are a primary care physician, then obviously you will not have, if you have, of course it is well and good, but you may not necessarily have access to fibroscan. So the test which you should use is a FIB4 score. So if you use a FIB4 score, which is less than 1.3, then you know that the patient is in safe zone. And then once it keeps on increasing beyond that, that will come uh, at the last few slides as to how you use it. But then if it is more than 1.3, then the risk is a little more. Uh, personally, I feel this cutoff is a little on the lower side. 1.5 may be uh, more uh, valuable for primary care physicians. But needless to say, anything above one below 1.5, you can say is okay, okay. More than 1.5, then you think of having a reference. And like I showed you, the FIB4 score is very easy to calculate. Just look at the age, SGOT, SGPT platelet count. That's it. And you get it in less than a half, less than half a minute. So once you do your LFT and hemogram, do make it a point to apply this to all patients. If you find that this, of course, is assuming that you have made a diagnosis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So if you are a primary care doctor, what you need to do is man comes to you with ultrasound or man or woman comes to you with transaminases. Do his hemogram, do his LFT, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, at least these many tests. Uh, you can do a lipid profile and look for some other comorbidities. Then you calculate the FIB4 score. And if there is something wrong somewhere, then you can have the patient referred. Now, when the patient comes to us with such a referral note, what do we do? So obviously, we go through the history. We look at what the primary care doctor has done. And then we have a fibro scan done. So on FibroScan, we do uh, a grading as to whether it is F0, that is, <coughs> I'm sorry, low fibrosis, F1, F2, and so on. So we do that. And then depending on that, we can apply it, which we'll see towards the end of this lecture. If the fibrosis is very severe, then of course, the patient has cirrhosis. And then you have to focus on tests, which you do for any patient with cirrhosis. So this is how you apply these tests in practice. Next slide. Now, how do you approach? This? Now, this actually again is an important slide and those interested could take a screenshot of this slide. So basically, suspect NAFLD, assess what is the alcohol intake, confirm that it is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and do some basic tests at least to rule out alternate causes. The next step you need to do is a risk stratification. So if you have a patient who is less than 40, non-obese, no diabetes, no metabolic syndrome, needless to say, this patient is fairly okay and not very likely to develop problems. If you have this red box on the right side, where AST, like I said, sometime back more than ALT, and uh, platelets are low, say 1 lakh 40 or below, fibrosis more than F4, F3 also, and a FIB4 score, which is on the higher side, then this patient really needs a lot of attention. And then there's always a gray area in medicine. Nothing is black and white in medicine. So you have this middle box where you have to individualize treatment. And these are the patients where you could consider liver biopsy in selected patients. Next slide. 
So we last part is management of NAFLD. Next slide. So now uh, NAFLD is considered as a multi-hit disorder. So it is not like uh, fatty liver and then one or two things happen and then the patient gets fatty liver. So you have all these factors right from uh, insulin resistance, gut dysbiosis, diabetes, so on and so forth. Then you have a genetic predisposition. And of course, at the top, you can see is the unhealthy lifestyle. So all these put together will lead to a fatty liver in a, in a particular patient. There are some patients, next slide. So this shows the progression, like we mentioned some time back, fatty liver, inflammation in the fat, leading to fibrosis, leading to cirrhosis, and leading to hepatocellular carcinoma. So we see a fair amount of patients who have HCC or hepatocellular carcinoma, where the underlying cause is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Next slide. So this shows the natural history of these patients. So if you look at 20 to 30% of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and you come down straight to this NASH figure, 5 to 10% of this, and fibrosis in one-third, and cirrhosis again in about one-third. It is by the sheer humongous numbers of these patients that you find a huge number of people with cirrhosis because of non -alcoholic. So by and large, if you look at an individual patient, the chance that this patient will have cirrhosis reasonably low, especially is in the low-risk low group. But if you look at the total population, because almost one in three, one out of four, one in four adults has this, there's a huge number of people with liver cirrhosis whom we find in. Uh, about natural history, there are various very good studies, including one which I did not include here in the NEJM. There are some patients who do very fast progress. Now, in simple terms, there are some people who say that stage-wise progression every seven years in non-alcoholic fatty liver alone and every 14 years in non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. The very simplistic view, maybe you can put it to four and eight years or five and 10 years. But the fact remains that once you develop this condition called a NASH, then you have progression. And then these are important people to target for treatment. Next slide. So this is again the same thing which we have shown. The reason I have kind of repeated this a little is to enhance uh, the concept that this is a progressive disease. Important thing is there is a long time frame where you can act and prevent further deterioration. Next slide. So how do you treat these patients? So in the last about 10 minutes, we'll discuss how do you treat these patients. So treatment, you aim at two main factors. One is you improve the insulin resistance and there are medicines to improve the liver. So diet, exercise, drugs, weight reduction for improving insulin resistance and drugs as well. And for improving the liver, there are a lot of drugs which are there in the market. Next slide. So this is the approach of currently available treatments. And this slide just uh, goes to show that uh, it should be more of a holistic treatment where you reduce cardiovascular uh, risk, you have liver diabetic, liver directed treatment, and of course weight loss. So we'll briefly touch upon some of these and two or three drugs which are commonly used in practice. Next slide. So like I said, uh, when you put your drug for trial uh, before the FDA or whatever authority you have, once you're treating these patients, how do you know that this patient is responding? So NASH resolution is one that is a transamine is one thing which they look at. There should be no worsening of fibrosis and especially there should be more than one fibrosis stage improvement, either on biopsy or on fibroscan. So these are endpoints which are taken in a lot of trials on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Next slide. So they give the drug, they give a placebo, they follow up these patients. The long trials are like the regenerate trial on uh, folic acid. So there they keep on doing all these tests periodically and see what will happen. Next slide. So in brief about these issues, next slide. So basically you should have your BMI calculated 
and then put them into these boxes. We won't go into the controversies over use of BMI. Uh, and then you can think of either uh, exercise, uh, su surgery in properly indicated patients and drugs. Next slide. So the take home message from this slide is that if you have a weight loss of seven to 10%, especially 10% by whatever means, there is fibrosis regression in about half the patients. So none of the drugs really has reached this level of uh, having this success. So it is basically the cheapest form of treatment. There's a lot of time for people to do that, but there are various reasons why it doesn't happen. But like I said, the take home message from this slide is if you can enhance your patient's motivation to weight, lose about 7 to 10%, 10% of his existing weight. So we don't want to bring the patient to ideal body weight. 80 kg man comes to around 72. Good enough. There's almost half chance that his fibrosis may regress. Next slide. Uh, this we can omit. Next slide. So this was what I mentioned some time back. That there are a lot of, especially studies from Dr. Abhijit Chaudhary's group in Kolkata. So they showed in a very huge population that uh, you have a lot of people who are lean and who have uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this is called as NAFLD in lean people or lean NAFLD. Uh, the important thing here is a lot of them have visceral obesity. So many times when you go to an NFLD conclave or conference, the question is asked whether these people should lose weight. So basically, they should not lose as much as we said for the other group, but they should try and reduce their stomach circumference by using various means. Next slide. Uh, dietary recommendations, these are of course for anyone to read. One thing which has got the fancy of a lot of workers is drinking coffee. So if you drink two cups of coffee, but needless to say, this should be with skimmed milk. And of course, there should be no added sugar. So if you drink that, it is believed to protect you from worsening of fatty liver disease. Fructose is something which is considered as poison for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So avoid fructose intake in these patients. Next slide. It is not still as common in India as much as it is in the US. So this fructose corn syrup and fructose uh, sweetened beverages, not too many people take in India, but it's slowly picking up. Next slide. This, of course, I won't be reading through, but you can take a screenshot. This just shows uh, where you find all these components of fats and how you should avoid them in people with NASH. Next slide. What are the drugs used in treatment of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Next slide. So this is a complicated but interesting slide because it shows how uh, an AFLD progresses. If you look at <coughs> the green bars, these are drugs which are in phase three of trials. And you can see that there's a huge number of drugs which people have been trying. On the left, you have targets of insulin resistance. Then you have medicines to decrease the lipotoxicity and oxidative stress of which Saroglitazor is something which we will discuss and Oka is something which we will discuss. And then you have cell death, cell uncertive and so on. And there, so there are various things where people are trying to target uh, in improving these patients' life. Next slide. We'll just quickly discuss on some of these common drugs and then we'll have a concluding slide. So next slide. So this trial was in the New England Journal of Medicine and it was a landmark trial and it was almost the earliest placebo controlled trial from Dr. Arun Sanyal's group. And what it shows was showed was if you give a combination of vitamin E and pioglitazone, there is improvement in all these parameters like insulin resistance and so on. So this actually set the ball rolling for various trials and drug trials in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Next slide. So what is about vitamin E? It can be, now, this actually is the realistic or the scientifically correct approach. But of course, it doesn't mean that we need to do a biopsy-proven uh, patient for a vitamin E. So 400 milligrams twice a day improves 
to the histology, but not fibrosis. And it is generally not recommended in diabetic patients. Also check for history of prostatic malignancy when you're starting this on long term, especially in the family. Uh, so vitamin E you can use in these patients, 400 milligrams twice a day for six to 12 months, taking all these precautions. Next slide. The other drugs which are used, metformin, if the patients are diabetic on metformin, continue it. But per se to use metformin in people who are adults and in ASH is not generally recommended. There are a lot of new anti-diabetic drugs which have been used in these conditions. Uh, you have the GLP-1, you have the SGLT-2, but we won't go into it. Bioglitazone, like I said, with biopsy proven NASH again improves liver histology in people who do not have diabetes. The, we used it quite a lot initially, but it led to a lot of weight gain. And somehow that kind of put us off from using this uh, drug. Of course, the people in diabetes know that it leads to a shift of uh, fat and so on and so forth. But this is something which is not very popular, but you can try it out in people without diabetes. Again, if the patient is a diabetic and already on it, you can continue it. Next slide. <clears throat> the last two drugs which we'll briefly discuss, one is obeticolic acid, which is a FXR uh, agonist. So these uh, Parnasoid X receptors, they are nuclear receptors and they have multiple key pathways which they affect. And an agonist which has been developed is obeticolic acid. And it kind of took the world by storm but in the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease field. Uh, but the use has not been as much as expected by a lot of pharmaceutical companies. And it has all these various actions which are very desirable. It is given in a dose of 5 mg twice daily and then increased to 10 mg twice daily. It is also used in primary biliary cholangitis. The main problem with this is the pruritus which it causes. But you can slowly increase the dose and use it. This has been shown in a very good trial. Next slide which was called the Regenerate trial. And this is a trial which is going to go on for five years. And this is an interim analysis. And it's a very well-conducted trial because there are serial biopsies also involved in it, showing up more than one stage fibrosis improvement by the use of 25 milligrams of obeticolic acid. And NASH resolution as well has been shown. So both the endpoints which we discussed some time back can be achieved with this drug. We used it in some patients, but it did cause pruritus. But I don't think we should lose heart and stop using it. I think it's a worth, uh, worthwhile drug using in people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Like I said, this trial is going to go on for five years. So if you find that at five years, this drug is going to be beneficial. Needless to say, it can be a drug which can be used for the longest period of time in these patients if the patient is tolerating the drug. Next slide. The other nuclear receptors or other targets are the PPAAR. So you have PPARs which are of three types, alpha, delta, and gamma. Uh, there are some which act only on one receptor and there are some which act on multiple. So one drug which has been developed in India uh, is saroglitazone. The drug was named so because in Gujarati, I believe Saro is, not I believe, I know Gujarati. So Saro is good. So Saro Che, we say. So it is a good glitazar. That is why it has been named as a Saro glitazar. And it has been in the Indian market, Indian market for quite some time. Next slide. So this shows again a beautiful depiction of various pathways where it is supposed to benefit. And uh, next slide. So there have been various clinical studies which have been done for this and they have been labeled by these acronyms with the blue colored and they have shown that these uh, these many benefits and in these trials of phase two, it has been beneficial. Next slide. The important thing here is the uh, certificate on the right side. So actually, if you look at all the drugs which you have just discussed, all of them are off-label indications. Vitamin E is off-label for NFLD. Uh, Bioglitazone is off-label. So all of them are off-label. But here you have got this permission for using this drug in India from the 
this drug control, controller generally. So this is one drug, at least in India, it has found a place in treating these patients. Now, how long you can use this and for whom should you use this? So it is generally used in people who have diabetes or people who have hypertriglyceridemia along with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In practice, it tends to bring down the transhumanesis quite well. And of course, needless to say also the triglycerides. So this is one drug which you can bear in mind when you are having patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Next slide. I think you can press it once more. Once more. Yeah. You can keep uh, keep pressing it. Till the, yeah. So this shows that it is a beneficial drug and it can lead to improvement in fibrosis and it can lead to improvement in transaminase. So this is a drug which holds promise across the spectrum from right from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with steatohepatitis to compensated cirrhosis. And there are ongoing studies, so you can't really say that it's an established drug, but at least it has managed to get permission from the uh, pharmaceutical authorities. Next slide. So last slide, we'll just summarize what we said. So if you have a patient come, who comes to you with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, either you are looking for it, or he has come with an ultrasound report or elevated transaminases. The first thing you make sure is there are no competing case causes and you have ruled alcoholic liver disease. The next thing you do universally is lifestyle modification for all these patients. And like I said, if you can manage a patient having lost weight about 10% and maintained it, there's almost certain chance that the fibrosis would have reversed. And how do you know it has reversed? You can do a fibro scan at the baseline and when you're following up. Then you do a fibrosis assessment. You can do it if you are a primary care physician with the FIB4 score. And then those, say, above 1.4 or 1.5, you can refer to a specialist center for fibro scan assessment. So if you have F0 to F1 fibrosis, then really you just monitor these patients and lay the main focus should be on lifestyle. If you have FT to F3, these are candidates for vitamin E, for obetic oleic acid, for pioglitazone, and for uh, seroglitazone. And there are many upcoming trials like for SGLT2 and so, and so on and so forth. So the field may change over the next two or three years. And these are the patients in whom you should try these medicines and follow them up. If you have, of course, F4 fibrosis, it means that the patient has already developed cirrhosis. These medicines are not likely to very, be very beneficial. And you have to evaluate them as any other cirrhotic. The right column is equally important, where you look not only at the liver, but at all these comorbidities, which I have mentioned here, and then have the appropriate left reference done. There are some centers in India which have a multidisciplinary non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this is an idea which probably a lot of us should take up uh, and uh, start these type of clinics to give a more holistic management. So you have a cardiology assessment, diabetologist, a nutritionist assessment, hepatologist assessment. And uh, that may lead to better outcomes and better early diagnosis of fibrosis in a lot of these patients. So next slide, I think we can end with this uh, concluding slide. So this was what uh, Mr. Shantaru kindly mentioned in his introduction. So we'll end with some good photographs which I happen to take. Okay. You can just click on the next few slides. So this was a ring-tailed uh, lemur clicked in Singapore. Uh, next slide. This was an owl, then next slide. Macaw. Next slide. So thanks for a patient hearing. And in case there are any questions, uh, I would be happy to answer them. So over to you. Yes. So one question has come uh, from the field that uh, 
if a person is having genetically induced nafl why he develops type 1 diabetes type 1 diabetes in a genetically predisposed nafl predisposed for non alcoholic fatty liver disease yes sir but they they really don't develop uh, type 1 diabetes because of the, the genes pnpla genes and others which are involved in non alcoholic fatty liver disease they are quite different so they will be predisposed to non alcoholic fatty liver disease on their own count but it will not predispose them to type 1 by the genetic abnormalities which are found in non alcoholic fatty liver disease i i hope i have answered it properly okay sir sir and another question has come any specific biomarkers has come right now to testify in the person yeah actually, there are a lot of uh, biomarkers and there are chapters and chapters on biomarkers but uh, see basically if you look at the fit for score it is one of the simplest biomarker so then there are fibro tests and there are many i omitted that slide for want of time but there are a lot of tests which are done as a combination uh, so there are two types of tests one is these and then there are collagen and fibrosis biomarkers which if you do that panel then you can but these are still all in experimental stage so a fibro uh, uh, fib4 score is something which we find pretty useful in practice and even if you look at the indian guidelines or a lot of other guidelines you now find that this fib4 score is uh, quite well included in the flow charts of these patients so i think if you look at biomarkers uh from a practical standpoint this group of uh, tests is a fairly useful biomarker for putting patients into various groups and generalizing them into uh, the mode of treatment so another very general question has come uh, from the uh, from the uh, audience is why nafl people die of cvd complications yeah the answer is actually uh, in more with the natural history of these patients so like i said uh, some people have put this in very simplistic terms suppose you diagnose a man with non alcoholic fatty liver disease at 35 suppose you assume that he has non alcoholic steatohepatitis in the early stage right sir this seven years he is going to progress so after about 28 years then he is likely to go from f0 to f4 which is cirrhosis and then he is likely to have complications related to that so the time frame for getting non alcoholic fatty liver disease complications is very slow and by that time the other disorders or the comorbidities can progress and kill the patient so that is why what happens is uh, you have morbidity because of cardiovascular disease some other malignancies even before the liver reaches a stage where it is going to kill that person this of course you have to remember is not in people who present with stage 4 fibrosis so if you find the fibrosis can be stage 4 fibrosis then of course your priority has to be the liver and also of course the comorbidities but it is because of the slow progression over years or decades that the other uh, organs unfortunately have the opportunity to take a toll on the patient So there is one question uh, that I would like to take up, uh, sir. Regarding the bariatric surgery for the patients who are actually obese, and you know, practically for them, it is unable to follow the lifestyle modification because of their weight. So, do you recommend this surgery for such patients? Definitely. So you and recommend it as metabolic surgery. So okay. what? I'll tell you what I do in practice. we go by the standard guidelines of metabolic i mean of bariatric surgery where it is indicated so we don't generally do it for somebody who is 25 to 30 or for that matter even 30 32 30, 34 bmi then we look at comorbidities and then decide whether then we have a referral to a bariatric surgeon and check with the bariatric surgeon whether this patient he would consider for uh, needless to say that when you have a patient say suppose 35 bmi of 34 35 he will not only be uh, on the higher weight side significantly with that bmi but he or she is likely to have lot of other comorbidities also so these patients we definitely refer for bariatric surgery 
and uh, in fact uh, there are a lot of slides on it also for the which i didn't show there are a lot of studies where they have done for uh, what they do actually is they do a liver biopsy needless to say when you are doing the bariatric surgery and you can do a fibro scan before doing the bariatric surgery you need a different probe for those patients which is called as the excel probe and uh, see what the fibrosis and you do the bariatric surgery and then you find out what has happened so there is definitely improvement provided you have chosen the patient correctly so is there any long term complications associated uh, with the surgery that patient should be aware of bariatric surgery basically is a topic by itself but it, it depends on which type you have done whether you have done a bypass or a sleeve to some extent the sleeve people have lesser complications not that they are very but there are so many things they need to do they have to come even if the surgery is done they have to follow the diet and most importantly especially if the patient has had a bypass then you need a lot of proper nutritional supplementation about 6 months back there was a patient who had a bariatric surgery which was a, a bypass kind of surgery and that lady said i have lost weight and uh, when i saw her, i saw her for the first time she looked like a cachectic patient uh, with malignancy and then when we checked with her she said that she thought after the bariatric surgery nothing is to be done and the weight loss was natural and she didn't follow, follow any nutritional advice she did not have follow up and then she required a fairly long period of uh, uh, for recuperation and putting on weight then we had to correct all the nutritional uh, uh, nutritional disorders which had uh, come in and then she had about i would say about 25 30% improvement but then after that i haven't seen her i don't know what what has happened to her later maybe she is seeing somebody else or whatever <laughs> <laughs> so i have a question so when do you are when it comes to the diagnosis of a fatty liver patient you are suspecting so you trust the you clinic a uh, clinical eye on that or you go for any non invasive test to uh, confirm it no you do require a non invasive test but i'll tell you something that uh, i had the opportunity to travel some time back uh, many years back to japan or some other middle east countries right sir there you find a lot of people are very slim and when you are sitting in the airplane seat and if you just look at that level what you see is stomachs of people who are coming in <laughs> so there you find all flat stomach people and if you are sitting in an indian flight this is not to shame indians but it's a fact you find lot of people with big stomachs so basically anybody who has a big stomach definitely is going to have fatty liver so if you ask me whether you can make a clinical diagnosis on a lighter note mm. anybody who has a big stomach is likely to have so that's what i said if you have an apple obesity the chance of you are uh, having fatty liver is pretty high but you finally need a confirmation so you can't say on uh, just by looking at the patient's stomach but if his waist circumference is more and so on then you know that this patient is so like i said in the physical examination and through probometry is an important thing so the higher all these parameters are the more likely the patient is going to have a fatty liver so you can make a suspicion or a clinical diagnosis confirmation of course is with an ultrasound right sir so it comes to the last question uh, sir regarding the biopsy there is a lot of controversy whether to you know have a biopsy uh, to see whether it is nafld or uh, it is nash so do you recommend a biopsy for that Bi- biopsy number has considerably gone down because now what has happened is if you look at a lot of these trials on so on non alcoholic fatty liver disease nash is what you get whatever you call it, one degree fibrosis reduction is required and that you can to some extent make out on a fibro scan so in our practice actually the number of biopsies which we did about 20 years back and today there is a very vast difference so there used to be few biopsies or quite a few biopsies every month and now after quite a few months there is one biopsy so it is completely become reverse but now if you ask me from practical standpoint as to whom i would biopsy so if you have a patient in whom there is some suspicion that there is wilson's disease there is hepatitis c which has been cured 
but the patient has fatty liver, then you don't know else. Uh, the third thing is if you uh, have a gray area patient, you have started on treatment and the transaminases are not improving or whatever, fatigue is not improving, then you can think of doing a liver biopsy. And then you can do the standard liver biopsy staging of uh, the CRN staging for these patients. Okay, sir. The important point for NASH patients actually is that the window of opportunity like it is called. If you have a patient coming with stroke in your casualty, or my, your window of opportunity is extremely small. Mm -hmm. And after that, you have missed the bus in giving thrombolysis or whatever. Here you have 50, 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 years window of opportunity. And the best results are with 8, 7 to 10 percent weight loss, which no other drug has matched. But still, unfortunately, for various reasons, we cannot achieve that in the clinic in individual patients. Very few can achieve that it and maintain. So the paradox here is that the treatment, which is seemingly simple and cheap, but which requires a lot of requires a lot of efforts and motivation, somehow does not get followed over the years. And that is why then you have to switch on to all these drugs. Now the longest trial is the regenerate for five years. About the other drugs, we we generally use it for six months, one year, but what next? So nobody knows what's the exit rule and what should you should be doing for these patients once that course is over. So that is something which I think has to be also remembered. So any types of nutritional therapy you recommend in this case? Because maximum times it has been seen that the nutritional um, deficiency has been reported with the hepatic patient. So any sort of... This nutritional, therapy? yeah, in nutritional, uh, I think a good protein intake brain, generally about 1 to 1.5 grams per kg body weight. You can use predominantly plant-based protein. So you can use soy protein or peas-based protein or something like that. And you can supplement. Nowadays, a lot of pharmaceutical companies have come up with fairly good protein products for people with liver disease. So you can use one of them. And uh, plus, of course, you can increase the... Like if you have a vegetarian who is wanting to increase his or her protein intake, predominantly you have five sources. Only. You have milk, milk products, you have dals, pulses, nuts, and soya bean. So there's not much you can... Uh, so all these you can reach a particular level, but beyond that, you need some nutritional supplementation. But do, sir, do this type of supplementation product like methionine, silymarine, uh, Lola, this have an effect on this, uh, your... Uh... Lola, no, definitely. Uh, but see, if you... For want of time, I didn't show all these drugs. So these are... See, if you look at uh, you, you, deoxypolic acid, hmm. you look at milk thistle, which is silymarin, and you look at s adenosyl methionine. These are the commonly used, and metadoxin in some. Hmm. So these are the three or four drugs which are used uh, pretty commonly in practice. Right, sir. They are potentially beneficial, but none of them is recommended in any of the guidelines. Okay. So you could definitely use them, but... Uh, if, if, you, if you look at individual trials on those drugs and you are doing a lecture on them, you will definitely find trials which okay. have been found uh, towards a positive note on these patients. But they are still not reached the level of recommendation guidelines. So definitely you can use them okay. in an individual patient, but you have to understand that like, uh, and the patient has to understand or be aware that the benefit is like plus minus. They're definitely not harmful. Uh, a lot of these drugs, I think, the main side effect is on the patient's pocket rather than on any other system. So you have to use them judiciously. Because there are some which are almost 100 rupees a tablet. Hmm. A lot of acetinosyl methionine is 80 to 100 rupees a tablet. So, sir, we can say that we are actually at the tip of the iceberg and it is still evolving. The research is still going on, but the lifestyle modification remains the core of it still. Yes. Uh, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, on behalf of Saffron and on behalf of our team team members, I extend a vote of thanks to you. Uh, despite of your busy schedule, you have been able to, you know, give a very enriching and an insightful talk. And I'm sure this will be very helpful to the hepatologists and the consulting physicians who have joined us today. 
and we look forward to your support and guidance sir going ahead and various our initiatives thank you so much okay, i would also you. thank, thank our, you, uh, i would also like to thank our delegates for joining us this evening and we have received your questions as well as comments and your presence is widely appreciated thank you so much sir once again thank you very much thank you sir